All right, thank you very much. So um, as already mentioned, Kieran can't make it today. Um, so I'm taking his place and use the opportunity to speak about quantum rotations of nanoparticles, a topic I've been working on uh, since a couple of years now. And in the next 25 minutes, I will try to convince you um, that the intrinsic nonlinearity of rotations um, renders them particularly attractive to test um, quantum physics, um, collapse models, and perhaps also gravitational um, decoherence models. And so, yeah, let me let me directly get started. Um, the Using aspherical particles has quite some tradition in levitated optomechanics, uh, simply because it's impossible to manufacture perfectly spherical objects. Um, people have investigated for several years now how one can precisely control the rotation of such objects um, in, in, with optical and electrical fields. Um, recent breakthroughs involve, for instance, the observation of precessional motion, which is a manifestation of the nonlinearity of classical rotations or um, seeing gyroscopic stabilization, another manifestation of the nonlinearity of rotations, or also just spinning nanoparticles with extremely high frequencies up to gigahertz. The different shapes that people have been using uh, range from shapes which are very well controlled like nano rods with a length of roughly one micron or nano dumbbells con consisting of two joint spheres um, to something which is, which is more like a randomly joined spherical particles or, or even more like potato shaped um, objects. And the motivations for doing so have, have been quite diverse. So historically, one of the first reasons why people started to look into aspherical particles is that they realized that using an object with an anisotropic susceptibility can enhance the coupling between the um, mechanical motion and the light field. And the reason for that is um, that, an, that such objects tend to align the axis of maximal susceptibility with the local field. Um, polarization and the susceptibility, so the optical response and along the maximal axis and uh, normally exceeds the average susceptibility or that of a sphere. And this leads to enhanced cooling rates, etc. Then another motivation is that one can add additional degrees of freedom to the to, to, to a single particle. So instead of just having three cents of mass degrees of freedom, you can also simultaneously address its uh, three rotational degrees of freedom. And as I will try to uh, convince you today, the main reason, at least for me, to look into the rotations of nanoparticles is that their intrinsic nonlinearity can give rise to novel quantum effects. So Rotations are also classically intrinsically nonlinear and anharmonic. That's already expressed in Euler's equations of rotation and, and translates to the quantum Hamiltonian for, for the rigid rotor. Um, orientation of degrees of freedom are periodic and non-commutative. And so this combination gives rise to free flight quantum interference effects, so which do not require any manipulation, any beam splitters or any coupling to two level systems, um, which have no analog in the free center of mass motion of the object. And this, and at the same time, if you can see such rotational interference phenomena, um, this observation um, falsifies objective collapse models to a degree which is comparable to a um, center of mass interference experiment with an object of comparable size and comparable time scale. And if you're more interested in the background on how to um, manipulate classical rotors and uh, what, what experiments have been planned, I encourage you to have a look um, at our recent uh, perspective together with Klaus Hornberger from the University of Duisburg and Myungshek from Imperial, um, which is about to appear in Nature Reviews Physics. Now, um, in the following 20 minutes, I will first um, explain to you two very pronounced manifestations of, of quantum interference in the free dynamics of a rigid rotor, which is the occurrence of quantum revivals and so-called quantum tennis racket flips. Then I will briefly outline our recent work on how the quantum regime can be achieved um, in the rotational degrees of freedom with state-of-the-art um, cavity cooling techniques. And in the end, I will briefly um, briefly discuss 
um, how the model of continuous spontaneous localization, so an objective collapse model, also collapses the orientation states or superpositions of a rotor pointing in different orientations will be collapsed to a, de to a degree which is comparable to the center of mass, uh, as long as the object is not, is not symmetric, as, as Martin already mentioned. All right, so orientational quantum revivals are a rotational interference effect um, of a linear rigid rotor, which is an, a rotor which is characterized by a single scalar moment of inertia, so it's a thin rod. And this orientational interference effect is a direct consequence of the quantum mechanical discreteness of the angular momentum, so it doesn't occur classically. And mathematically, um, it is the observation that uh, the unitary time evolution operator of this object um, because of the discrete spectrum of the rotor, which goes with the total angular momentum quantum number j times j plus one, um, becomes the identity for integer multiples of the quantum characteristic revival time. And this quantum revival time is completely determined by the moment of inertia of the particle and by h bar. So there is no external manipulation and um, no potentials required. That's the dynamics of a free rotor. So what does that mean? It means that an arbitrary initial state will always return to its initial state. For instance, if we could prepare a nano rotor in a state which is extremely well aligned, so we align it with a linearly polarized laser field and somehow cool it close to the quantum ground state so that it is aligned at the quantum limit, and then we switch off the laser and release it, then what will happen after a relatively short period of time is the orientation will disperse. Just like in the center of mass, the orientation will start to point into um, an almost uniformly distributed orientation. And the reason is the um, uncertainty in the angular momentum, in the initial angular momentum, so different angular momentum states rotate with different speeds. But at the quantum revival time, out of nothing, the rotor will return to its initial orientation. And this would not happen with a classical rotor with an initial uncertainty, a thermal uncertainty in its angular momentum um, distribution. And this return of the um, rotor orientation has been observed with uh, small diatomic molecules and even slightly larger objects, but it hasn't been observed with nanoparticles. It could be observed in principle by scattering from a weak laser pulse, and then one could think about re-trapping the rotor and recycling it and, and repeating the entire experiment. Now, the reason why it is difficult to observe this is apparently that this revival time is proportional to one over h bar. So it can get extremely large even for small objects. So for instance, this pen here would have a revival time scale, which is in numbers, the age of the universe squared. I mean, it doesn't make sense unifies, but in principle, the number would be the age of the universe squared. And so that's incredibly long. But if you scale it down to, to small objects like 50 nanometers length and diameter of a few nanometers, like double wall carbon nanotubes, which are relatively stiff and have a mass of about two times 10 to the five atomic mass units, then this revival time can be on the order of milliseconds. And that's uh, indeed within experimental reach. Um, the, the distance that the particle drops during the experiment in, in the gravitational field would be merely 70 micrometers. So it also should be relatively, or it should be possible to retrap particle. So what would the resulting interference pattern look like? Well, when you measure the totals or when you measure the sc light scattered from the particle, what you in fact measure is the expectation value of the cosine squared of the angle between the rotor orientation and the field polarization of the probe pulse. So you measure, you do a cosine squared of beta measurement where beta is the polar angle between the two. And what you would see is if you measure at, at variable times, you would see that for most of the times, you measure something like a uniform distribution, which slowly decays because of environmental collisions with residual gas atoms, so the coherence slowly decays, but it follows the classical curve, which is depicted here as the red dashed line. But in, at intermediate times, for, for relatively short times, um, the rotor almost perfectly returns to its initial orientation, and that's the quantum signature. And the time scale, so, so the duration of this revival is completely determined by the initial temperature of the rotor. And it can be on the, on the, on the order of several uh, microseconds for, um, for temperatures below uh, millikelvin. 
Now, what, what diminishes the, um, the intensity, so to say, or the visibility of the interferochrome over time is the coherence. So as in center of mass interference experiments, the main sources of the coherence are scattering with residual gas atoms and um, the emission of black body radiation because the rotor is presumably hot um, since it will absorb some photons during the cooling process. Now, I really want to stress here, this is, an interfer this is a proposed interference experiment, which doesn't require any sort of beam splitter or external potential to, to, to get the interference effect. So it requires no grating, um, but on the downside, the, the revival time strongly depends on the extension of the rotor. So it should, it, it would be better to, to, um, to recycle the particle and reuse it and, and not repeat it with, with different particles. Um, then some technical detail, it's, it's independent of the laser wavelengths because the trapping potential doesn't depend on it. And um, it allows testing collapse models to a degree similar to that of center of mass interference of objects of, of comparable size and with comparable time scales. Now, that's orientation of quantum revivals. They only occur for linear rigid rotor. Fractional revivals occur for any types of rotors, but they are much more complicated and, and um, more difficult to control. But there is a strong interference effect um, for asymmetric particles. And that effect is dubbed the quantum tennis racket effect. So let me briefly summarize um, the classical or recapitulate the classical tennis racket effect. The tennis racket effect um, is the mid-axis instability. So we have an, of, of an asymmetric rotor. So we have a rotor with three distinct moments of inertia um, and it rotates freely, it revolves freely. And we assume that it initially rotates um, fast very rapidly around the axis of the intermediate moment of inertia E2 here. And there are two conserved quantities, which is the total energy and the total angular momentum. And this is, the problem is integral. I mean, there are three conserved quantities, the, the problem is integral, um, but you can reduce the dynamics to a 1D problem by using these two um, conserved quantities. And what you get is you get a double world potential. So the dynamics of the asymmetric rotor are um, are equivalent to 1D dynamics of a planar rotor, so with periodic round boundary conditions in a double wall potential. And what that means physically, uh, you can see it here in the video, is this experiment which has been carried out at the ISS. So if you rotate it, the rotor will start flipping between its mid axis pointing forward and backward. And this flipping motion is due to the instability of mid-axis rotations. And that's what's referred to as the classical tennis racket effect. And in this um, double world picture here, it refers to the fact that if you start, um, if, if you prepare the rotor initially in a state, in a classical state, which is very close to the top um, of this double world, it's like an inverted pendulum initially. So it will accelerate down and then become very slowly return on the other side where it's exactly pointing in the opposite direction and then go round and round and round. And so this, this top of the potential, technically speaking, uh, defines a separatrix where your trajectories um, fall into two categories, rotating, which are dubbed rotating and oscillating solutions. And the rotating solutions um, are rotations around the um, maximal axis of inertia and the, um, the oscillations are rotations around the minimal axis of inertia. And that's, that's the classical tennis racket effect. So if you now start, if you now prepare a rotor initially um, in a thermal state close to this top, what will happen is that many, all these trajectories will, will start to you know, go to the other side at the same time, but they will do at very different frequencies because you start very close to the separatrix. So the, the, the time scale of, of arriving on the other side will diverge logarithmically with the energy distance from the separatrix. So it will take infinitely long if, the, if, if, if you think of a pendulum, an inverted pendulum, if it's perfectly balanced on the top. Now, surprisingly, that's not what happens quantum mechanically. And the reason is that quantum mechanically, 
Um, what you get in addition to this, oscillate, this, this, this distinction between oscillating and rotating um, trajectories or semi-classic trajectories is washed out by quantum reflection and tunneling contributions. And what one obtains as a result is that these tennis racket flips do not average out, but they turn persistent and they can persist for a very, very long time. And the criterion for having these tunneling or for getting these tunneling contributions relevant for, for so that they um, have a, an impact on, on the um, trajectories or on the, on the interference in the end is that the rotor rotation rate uh, new knot over the thermal width of the initial state is approximately larger than 0 0.1. And that's, for instance, achievable at millicolon te temperatures for gigahertz um, rotation frequencies. And so that's what, what an interference experiment would look like. Again, one measures the orientation of the um, mid-axis so of this E2 by optical light scattering at variable times. And while the classical expectation would quickly decay to zero and completely average out, one should um, observe persistence in these oscillations for a very, very long time scale compared to the classical decay time. And again, that's a quantum interference effect. It decays with the coherence, and it's only due to the, non to the intrinsic nonlinearity of rotations. Now, let me briefly talk about how, how we could reach this regime of quantum rotations. Um, and then in particular about a recent, uh, recent uh, work of, from, from uh, the Duisburg group on how to extend the coherent scattering setup, which successfully prepared the center of mass um, of uh, nanoparticles in the quantum ground state in the Aspermeyer group, how this could be extended to achieve a simultaneous rotational and translational ground state cooling. Um, and simply by using an elliptically polarized um, and, and, and elliptically shaped tweezer. Um, and the reason why, why this works or what, what's different is normally if you have a linearly polarized laser, the rotor tends to align his axis of maximum susceptibility with the polarization axis. But that also means that rotations around this axis are invariant and therefore always conserved. So it's hard to extract energy from them. You could break this symmetry by using an elliptically polarized laser like we propose. So this elliptically polarized laser gives rise to a conservative force where you can really align all um, three orientational degrees of freedom. There's no invariances. But the problem is if you use elliptically polarized tweezers, then um, scattering, so um, scattering of photons will lead radiation pressure, sort of ro rotational radiation pressure torque will lead to an angular acceleration and to heating of the rotor. So there's also a non-conservative torque, which is associated with the scattering, the angular momentum transfer from individual photons. And this torque has been observed in numerous um, classical experiments. For instance, this was used together with the sh shape anisotropy to spin aspherical rotors to very high frequency, up to, up to gigahertz frequencies. Now, interestingly, um, one can balance those two and find a regime where the detrimental impact of the um, non-conservative torque is sufficiently weak that one can still reach the combined um, rot uh, ground state in, in all um, rotational degrees of freedom. And so um, the electric field, which appears here in both the conservative and the non-conservative torques um, is the local electric field at the center of mass position of the particle. And that's made up of, from both the field of the tweezer, so the elliptically polarized tweezer and the field the cap, um, of, due to the cavity modes. There are two orthogonal cavity modes if you place two mirrors and the motion of the particle will now scatter photons and start populating these cavity modes. And then the retarded reaction or the dispersive interaction with the cavity mode can, if you choose the detuning between the tweezer and the cavity resonance appropriately, can re extract motional energy from the particle was via um, scattering. And so if you, if you linearize everything and the rotor is deeply trapped, um, the, it turns out that the total Hamiltonian um, decomposes into two independent contributions where a set, one set of degrees of freedom only talks to one of the two cavity modes and the other set 
um, of degrees of freedom talks to the other cavity mode. So uh, one is the three sense of mass degrees of freedom and uh, the rotation in the plane um, of, of the cavity field and the other, the remaining two degrees of freedom. And then by um, choosing the, 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 the detunings and, and all tweezer parameters appropriately, um, and depending on the asymmetry of the particle, one can either achieve a regime where only the rotations are cooled into the ground state or center of mass is cooled, or if the particle is only slightly spherical, where all six degrees of freedom are cooled simultaneously in the combined um, ground state regime. So that's the mean for non occupations. Now, why is this relevant? Yeah, five minutes, Ben. Perfect. Um, why is this relevant? Well, on the one hand, it can be used for torque sensing. Um, but on the other hand, it can be used to prepare these uh, interference experiments that I um, mentioned earlier. So for instance, by switching the tweezer from elliptic polarized to circular polarized, one can quickly, so in a matter of milliseconds, ex rotationally accelerate the particle to reach the tennis racket regime without heating it up too much. So you really reach the regime where, where the rotation frequency divided by KVT is such that you, these tennis racket flips are observable. Now, let me use the last five minutes to briefly talk um, about the implications for, of, of such um, rotation interference experiments for testing collapse models and, and perhaps um, also models of gravitational decoherence. Um, one can derive from the, from the model of continuous spontaneous localization and in a similar matter from um, the Kiyoshi Penrose model of decoherence, that um, the orientation state of the rotor is affected by the CSL um, um, uh, Lindblad operators. And for, for a rigid body with um, mass distribution rho of, of R, what really matters is the Fourier transform of this, so the shape function, the shape function of this, uh, the shape factor, sorry, shape factor of this mass distribution, and how strongly it depends on the orientation. So if, if it would be a spherical particle, then, so this here is the rotation uh, matrix, so which rotates the part particle into its, um, from which rotates between the lab and the body fixed frames. And if this particle were spherical, then this function would not depend on this rotation matrix because it would only depend on the on the absolute value of k. But if this is, for instance, a, a cylindrically shaped particle, then it depends on the orientation. And that this can give rise to localization of the orientation state as quantified by the CSL collapse rate and length scale in this model, for instance. The resulting uh, localization rate um, depends then on the difference between the shape function of the um, rotated body as compared to the not rotated body. So how strongly does, does the mass distribution really differ um, when, you, when you rotate the body? That's a measure for it. Um, interestingly, the, um, it, 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 in addition to the coherence, it also um, describes a heating for small displacements. So for small superposition sizes, you would expect collapse induced heating like for the center of mass. And surprisingly, these heating rates um, scale depend differently on the collapse parameters um, than for the center of mass motion. So if you would have a candidate heating mechanism, for instance, where you, where you strongly believe this could be due to collapse, then you should see it in a single particle, both in the center of mass and in the rotation. And it should be in a regime where the two lines intersect. Um, yes. And surprisingly, it turns out that the degree um, to which, or not so surprisingly, it turns out that the degree to which you constrain collapse models so that if you want to call it the degree of microscopicity of a quantum experiment, um, is the same for a rotation interference experiment as for a comparable center of mass experiment. All right, um, with that I'm done. Um, I try to convince you that the nonlinearity of rotations is a relevant resource which could be exploited for many technological applications, but also for testing um, quantum physics and perhaps uh, gravitational effects. Um, I 
briefly outlined elliptic coherent scattering for achieving the cooling and briefly mentioned orientation collapse. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, virtual class. So, Anupam, you have a question? Yeah. Hi, Ben. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, so, I'm a bit confused when you speak about uh, gravitational decoherence. What exactly you have in mind? What is the process? What is the? Can you write? I mean, can we? Can you say something about? Yes. Um, to be honest, I mean, the the only thing where we really calculated it is is, is the Dirichlet Pen model. Um, apart from that, okay. Yes. Apart from yes, that's that's for what we calculated. Because you know the gravitational. I mean, uh, any if you draw a Feynman diagram and you would see yes. that. Um, the gravitational decoherence is a very, very tiny because it's suppressed by absolutely, uh, absolutely. frequency omega cube divided by M Planck square. Absolutely. So, so my statement is not that it's better than center of mass or, or stronger or in any, yeah. My statement is rather than in contrast to center of mass interference, uh, or it has the same impact uh, on, on the rotational decoherence than on center of mass decoherence in, in many cases. At the same time, doing rotational interference might be easier because you don't need beam splitters. Okay. And, and for instance, you don't have the problem with that you, you need a trapping potential. Um, so the, the rotor can be, the center of mass can be trapped and decoupled from the rotations. It can freely rotate for, if you, if you have a suitable trap, it can rotate for long times. So okay. my, my argument is um, yeah, more about this aspect. Maybe let me let me use this opportunity also to thank my collaborators. I forgot that. <laughs> Sorry. So team uh, Imperial College where I stayed uh, for a year. Uh, UA Kieran who couldn't make it today, and Mjungchik of course, and and uh, team of Klaus Hornberg at the University of Duisburg Essen. All right. Tejinder, you have a question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk, Ben. So I had a question. Uh, uh, quantitatively, what would be the approximate bound on the CSL collapse parameter? Would it be around 10 to the minus 5 per second or even stronger? Um, so he, here it's 10 to the minus 12. I don't remember the numbers exactly. Um, that's a heating. A, a, that's, um, so these experiments haven't been done yet. So that's a, a hypothetical heating experiment with nano rotors, I think on the order of magnitude as they were used in the experiment by Marcus Arndt and James Mill. So these uh, one micrometer long rods, but I would have to look it up. So, you know, you get these type of exclusion curves where for, yeah, where everything right. of this so curve I, is. I think Marcus was probably here, if I remember, his best bounds are around 10 to the minus five, minus six, maybe if he's here, he could tell us. So. So I think the state of the art best tests are uh, due to center of mass heating experiments, if I'm not mistaken. Um, um, if Hendrik uh, is here, he should, he should, he, he perhaps knows. Is Hendrik here? So, but, but Ben is right in uh, when he's saying that the best, uh, best exclusion of the rays is really due to uh, heating experiments respectively. Uh, Catalina Pucciano had the absence of X-rays in, uh, in her germanium detector, so to say. Huh? So the absence of uh, anomalous X-ray radiation, I think that is currently the still best. No, I agree. I was asking the rotational interference, not the heating. How mm -hmm. good would that bound be? Ah, okay. Um... I would have to look up. I, I don't know. So um, if, you, if you do the revival experiment, so... Um, this one here, then we calculated that the macroscopicity of this experiment, so the degree to which it rules out collapse models, is comparable to the um, Bateman Nimbrichter proposal of doing center of mass near field interference with 10 to the 6 armor particles. Now, if anyone knows what the bound on collapse parameters would be in that experiment, then we would have the answer. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't remember it, sorry. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ben, yeah. I have a question. Um, to the best of your knowledge, what is now the state of the art on rotational cooling? Um, Sub-Kelvin temperatures. 
So um, I think the the so there as, as far as I know there have been three experiments to show um, rotational cooling of levitated nanoparticles. Um, two of them via feedback cooling and so optical feedback cooling, and one of them uh, via um, NV embedded NV centers and 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 driving yeah and and microwave fields and and driving the transition on the on the red side band. Um, right. And I think they achieved so I think the group of Lucas Novotny achieved something below Kelvin, but I'm not, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. My, my uh, uh, I guess you're talking about the experiment by Gabriel Etet with, um, uh, with the indictment. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But I think, I think the, the experiment by Van, Van der Laan and Al from the group of Lucas Novotny, they achieved mm -hmm. even lower temperatures. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, there are no other questions. We're just on time to get started with the next talk. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks. Um, yeah, Mark, you want to share your slide? Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so we'll hear now from Marco. Okay, let, let me just make a small disclaimer. So there's a large thunderstorm approaching. So um, I hope that my internet connection will be stable, uh, but I had some problems um, this afternoon. So hopefully it will go smoothly. Um, so today um, I will talk about relative acceleration noise, and how to mitigate it for matter wave in matter wave uh, interferometry experiments. And then I will talk about uh, the application to the QGEM protocol. So let me uh, just talk a little bit about uh, my academic path. So I started in the University of Trieste as a theoretician, but working relatively close to phenomenology of matter waves. And then I moved to the UK, working on first on optomechanics in, uh, at the University of Southampton. Then I moved to University College London, where I also became interested in how to probe quantum gravity in the lab. And now I'm currently um, at the University of Glasgow, where I work on photointerferometry. So as a nice segue to what I will talk about, uh, let me just publicize two of uh, the works. So I'm working in a relatively large experimental group, so I'm um, also collaborating both with Daniele Faccio and Miles Paget. And one of the things we are interested in is sensing of rotational motion. So one can um, essentially have a quantum sensor of rotational motion. And this is, um, uh, let's say, one type of non-inertial motion, but one can also have linear accelerations as well as curvature effects. Uh, so today I will talk precisely about linear accelerations and the noise associated with linear accelerations, as well as the noise associated to curvature terms. Um, so in the first part, I will try to be very pedagogic and I will try to convey the key um, physical concepts using mainly pictures, very, very few equations. And in the second part, I will talk, talk how to apply um, this um, formalism to the QGM experiment. And in particular, I will discuss non-inertial jitter and gravity gradient noise. Most of the things so um, have been done in collaboration uh, with um, from with Thomas on the camp, Ryan Marshall, Professor Mirsha King, Professor Anupam Mazumdar, and Professor Sugato Bose. And you can read about uh, this in its recently published paper. I also want you to um, point you to another related work which approaches some of the same question but with a slightly different angle. So this is a work by Andre Grossart, who incidentally was postdoc during my time of the PhD in the same group in Trieste. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, start with the presentation. So the experiment I have in mind uh, is an interferometry experiment. So here in the center, you see um, a spatial superposition of nanoparticle. So these are the two black dots. Uh, this, uh, this quantum system is placed inside the box. So this would be the experimental box that will contain all of the experimental apparatus. Uh, for example, one can have magnets to control the superposition. Uh, 
but for now, let's just focus on uh, this picture here. So assuming that there's nothing else in the problem, so such a system will just follow a geodesic. So it will be in free fall. So it's not a suspended system. It's just an ideal experiment for the moment. Uh, and um, one has the notion of the ideal inertial observer, which will follow the geodesic and can describe the experiment. But one also have the notion of the experimental observer. Uh, now, since which is attached to the experimental box. So it's essentially this experimental uh, observer sort of holding the walls of the experimental box. But because everything is in free for the system and the box, uh, there is no difference um, for what the experimental observer describes and what the inertial observer describes. For example, if the system, um, speaking classically for just for, to give the idea, has position x and velocity and momentum p, both will agree. Now, this is an idealized experiment, but there, there is this clear distinction between these two notions. So the inertia observer, an ideal observer, and the observer attached to the experimental box. However, in practice, this box will not be in, let's say, um, in completely isolated, but will be, for example, immersed in a bath of um, dust particles. Each time, this uh, dust particle hits the walls of this box, it will make all the experimental apparatus in the box jigger. So for example, if a box collides, the system will no longer follow the geodesic, but will feel a, the box will no longer follow the geodesic, but will feel a small acceleration. And this will be sort of left and right ac random acceleration due to the kicks of these dust particles. Um, so, in this case, what the experimental observer says about position and velocity will differ from what the inertial observer sees. But as the experimental observer is sort of is attached to the experimental box, it, this is the questions that the experimental observer says about position and velocity are the ones that are being measured. Here, the system is still in free fall. So the system is still, let's say, following geodesic motion while the experimental box is jigging around. So one has really two different systems: the, the quantum system, like the nanoparticle, and the box. And each of these can move. However, now, for now, the two have, I have just said that there is a quantum system inside the box. But there is a key ingredient missing in this picture. That is how to prepare the superposition and then recombine the superposition. For example, here one can have um, a magnetic free gradient and a spin dependent force, and one can create a superposition of two paths, sort of a left path and a right path. And this is sort of in this part where the experimental apparatus couples to the system. But because the experimental apparatus is also attached to the box, there is now an and non, um, uh, there is now an effect due to the gas particles hitting the box. So essentially this random uh, accelerations felt by the box are also fed by the experimental apparatus. And when the system and the experimental apparatus are coupled, this can cause this relative acceleration noise. So this is, um, and in let's say speaking classically, but quantum, in the, when we have a quantum system, this can lead to a loss of coherence. So one will experience random phases on the left path and on the right path due to these kicks of, of due to environmental gas particles. But in principle, it could be any other um, force that makes the, the box jigger. So there's an, um, this is, let's say, um, a first effect I want to discuss. So this is related to just a um, uniform um, potential, which gives rise to accelerations. So here I'm just talking about non-inertial effects. I have not yet talked about curvature effects. Now, the next thing I want to introduce is an external mass, a very heavy external mass. And now I want to talk about curvature effects. So, well, consider, for, let's say, a very heavy mass located in proximity of this box. So one has two, uh, let's say, the system 
will feel different potential depending on the distance um, from the from this external mass. So, I said, for example, at this at larger distances, the system will feel a smaller potential, but at smaller distances, it will feel a larger potential. In this case, it is not anymore uh, enough to discuss to describe the experiment using a single geodesic or a single time-like curve, but one really needs multiple uh, multiple time-like curves, and this is essentially it's a finite size effect. So it's no longer um, uh, so it's not no longer a local effect, but it's really due to the finite extension of the experiment. Uh, now this phases can again if this object is moving around randomly it can generate random phases and it can again lead to a noise and we will call this as gravity gradient noise and quantum mechanically this random phases can lead to a loss of coherence of course if one has a very large mass nearby that is not moving one can of course calibrate the experiment so that because in each run of the experiment, you will have, one will have the same uh, phase difference due to this fixed mass. But if the mass is really moving away in a random way, such as a person running around or um, a car driving in circles and or in some strange way, then this can lead to a loss of coherence. I want to point to two things here. Um, first one um, is that um, if one has a symmetric superposition and just consider this intermediate part and doesn't focus on, let's say, the creation and separation and, and combination part of the interferometric loop, the effects will va vanish or they may be, be very, very tiny. And this is, um, can be shown quite generally. But when there is a creation and recombination part of the experiment, this gravity gradient noise gets amplified by the, uh, by the transferred momentum between the box and the system. And I will try to convince you about this point in the next slide. So this is the more or less the only slide with equations I will have. So let me just say to model such, um, such background gravitational field, one can start with the Fermi normal coordinates. This is very convenient um, coordinate choice. One can read it in many, even, even in textbooks in the book Gravitation, but it goes back to a paper by Manasseh um, um, from the 70s, I think. In the, in the norm, and here I will focus just on the non relativistic leading order effects, where the T thin component of the metric is, is the one playing um, an active role. So here one has these acceleration terms, and then one has these curvature terms. From this metric, one can then find Lagrangian. Uh, so this will be again, again, th there is a kinetic term. Then there's a term which is the con which controls the superposition. So for example, this can be due to a magnetic field gradient coupled to spin. So like in the QGM protocol, so one can create by um, switching the sign of this lambda, one can create, create or recombine the superposition. Then there is an acceleration term, which comes from this part of the metric. And then there's a curvature part, which comes from this part of the metric. Now, this acceleration part will be in general will be time dependent, randomly uh, fluctuating term. And also this curvature term will be a randomly fluctuating uh, term with a sort of this omega squared can flip from positive to negative. And these are the terms that can use phasing. Now, let me make a first observation. Uh, this goes to what I mentioned the previous slide about momentum transfer. Now, to leading order, the trajectory is fixed by these two first term. So the magnetic um, uh, forces will be much, much, much larger than any of these forces on these last two terms. So the trajectory is largely fixed by these two terms. So one can find a solution, which is largely just a function of the magnetic field gradients. However, the accumulated phase depends on the whole Lagrangian. So one can compute phases in, an, in the interferometric loop. One plugs the solution, which depends on the magnetic field gradients 
back into the action. And these two terms get multiplied by a, by a position dependent path, by a path that depends on the magnetic field gradient. So the acceleration noise gets coupled to the magnetic field gradient. Similarly here, again, the path depends largely on the magnetic field gradients. So, and this goes into the position. And so the gradient gradient noise gets amplified. So these two terms are effectively amplified by how large, so how fast we create this proposition by the momentum transfer. Uh, so um, one, one also has other cross terms. So one has a cross term between this and this term, but these have much, much, much smaller effects. One has also a term that depends just on this or just on this, but these are subleading effects. So in the following, I will just talk about this leading order effects where the acceleration noise and the gravity gradient noise is amplified due to the net momentum transfer. Finally, let me just mention how to model this acceleration and this gravity gradient. Uh, so the acceleration noise is related to how the box jiggles left and right. And the box can be modeled with, um, with let's say, a, a simple um, large even equation. So this is a zero for the model. And one can, of course, make it more and more uh, um, sophisticated. So this is like an initial noise budget. Um, uh, here one has essentially that the, um, the velocity, the momentum is dumped, then has, has a noise due to um, um, uh, gas collisions. One can also think about constraining the motion of the box horizontally by adding a very, very weak potential. Uh, so it here, because I'm really focused just on the horizontal motion, one can, um, one can also have just essentially an unconstrained motion along the horizontal axis. It's not so important that it's the whole thing is in free fall, but of course that will uh, probably um, be also useful in the end. Um, so, but there, there's, let's say there are different options at this point on how to uh, implement the, the, the experiment. So having said that, let me now um, move to the QGM experiment. So here, um, all these equations on the previous slide essentially lead to a dumping of coherences. So um, one has an effective entanglement phase. So let me just remind you. Um, so there are two spheres. Each is placed in a superposition. They are placed at such a distance that they are all interactions apart the gravitational one are strongly suppressed. So if one detects an entanglement phase, one can be sure that it's really due to gravity. Uh, this entanglement phase must be, much, must be first large enough so that it can be detected, but also much larger than all other um, dumping of, of coherences. So this can be this jitter. So for example, collisions on the external wall of this box but it also can be also due to gravity gradient induced by an external mass. And of course, one also has to consider all additional channel, channels that can lead to a loss of coherence, like body radiation and so on. Um, let me now first uh, give some numbers about um, that I will use in the following. So um, as these are just ballpark figures. So you have seen already today, there's some interesting developments um, on how to improve this experiment. But let us just take um, this number. So 10 to the minus 15 kilograms. This is the mass of an individual sphere. So the two spheres are then placed at 50 micrometers. And each sphere is put in a superposition of about 20 micrometers. Uh, the, let's say the duration of the experiment. So from uh, creation to combination, it's about two seconds. Uh, now, non let me talk first about this non-inertial jitter. So the dust particle hitting the wall of this container, which can induce a loss of coherence. And I want to understand how this changes when I change the mass of the box and the surface area of the box. Uh, very, so here, um, it's, uh, I have again shown the same experiment. And the question is, how can I reduce this non-inertial jitter, which can lead to a loss of coherence, 
so that I can still observe the entanglement phase. Now, uh, the heavier the box, the less it will jiggle. And the smaller the surface area, and also the, le the, the less it will jiggle. So in this plot on the right, I have the experimental box mass. So the heavier the mass, the better. So I want to be here. And on the vertical axis, I have the experimental box size. So the smaller the box, the better. So I would like to be here. But unfortunately, one cannot have too, too large uh, densities. So we are effectively constrained to this upper gray white uh, part of the, of the diagram. So just to give a concrete example, so I have plotted here um, the short capsule used uh, in Bremen, in the drop tower. So this is a couple of, um, I think I'll count 150 kilograms and a little bit that less than one meter in size. So for such a box, um, one can have, uh, one can satisfy this condition that um, the, the relative acceleration noise or the non-inertial jitter noise is sufficiently suppressed if one ta uh, take, uh, um, puts the whole box in an environment where the pressure is kept below 10 to the minus six pascals. One can also consider smaller or larger um, box sizes but probably the most interesting if you want to consider a bit smaller box sizes. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, a bit smaller box sizes. So for example, this green dot here, one has a mass of maybe 10, 20, 30 grams, and maybe a centimeter size. Such a box, because it's very small, could be, for example, put in a shaft. So one does not require maybe a very large drop tower, but maybe a shaft would be enough. So a very a very small drop tower or maybe a tunnel, very small um, tunnel underground. Um, and by placing, of course, the requirement on the pressure then becomes uh, more stringent. So one requires 10 to the minus nine pascals. Um, so this is the first effect I want to discuss. So this is the relative acceleration noise that effectively, these are electromagnetic effects that kick the particle. Of course, the particle being in free fall, all other, um, let's say, the linear terms of other external mass are completely gone. Uh, the only thing that an external mass can generate is this gravity gradient noise due to the finite size of the experiment. Now, when such a mass is, again, it's stationary, one can simply calibrate the experiment and subtract the effect of these phases. The problem is when this mass moves around in a random way, such as a human a car or even random planes or some seism seismic or atmospheric effect. Uh, when, so we have, again, uh, we have again an entanglement phase and we want that the damping of coherence due to this gravity gradient noise is sufficiently suppressed. So we need to make sure that such masses, even if they move in random ways, they're sufficiently far from the experiment. So at, they can approach it to, let's say this R mean, which is the minimum distance of approach, but otherwise they can move randomly around. Of course, like typical sources of noise have been already characterized. So this is some earlier um, papers that which, which have studied this in detail for other experiments. And we find that because this is a very tiny, tiny experiment, so these are a, um, a few tens of micrometers, that seismic and atmospheric noise is pretty much strongly suppressed. So as long as the whole, the noise does not originate, let's say at uh, a few um, uh, centimeters, we are fine. It would be essentially, these are probably are usually very distant objects, like hundreds of meters, or maybe 10 meters or even one meters. And um, so it is enough essentially to not be completely unlucky, let's say by, I don't know, a, a cloud flying in, into the drop tower or something very unusual. But so this can be neglected for, for all purposes. More problematic are humans if they are moving randomly around, um, let's say the experimental box, 
or in the drop tower. But even here, it's enough to constrain the humans to be um, farther than a few meters. Uh, similarly, cars uh, need to be constrained to be about um, a, a few tens of meters, maybe 50, 60 meters. And planes need to be further than a few hundred meters. So it is probably enough to be a little bit away from uh, a busy airport and the gravity gradient noise can be under control. Uh, so, so let me now more or less conclude this talk. So I have discussed two effects. Uh, one was the um, relative acceleration noise due to a uniform potential, which can be generated by dust, um, dust particles hitting the walls of the container. This makes the whole box jiggle. The other effect I have discussed is um, gravity gradient noise. So this is curvature effects. Uh, when this mass moves around uh, the box in an uncontrollable way, or there can be seismic or atmospheric uh, noises. Uh, in both cases, critical was the momentum transfer between uh, the system and the box, which amplifies these effects. And now the question is, now I want to sort of reverse um, the question. So instead of saying that this is um, a noise term that is taken under control, one can also view it that by preparing such an experiment or even creating large superposition of large masses for a significant amount of time, one can really create an amazing sensor. And there was a very nice discussion like yesterday, uh, very in the last panel discussion. What are the low hanging fruits that one can do with this experience? I think pushing the idea that this can be really amazing sensors is a really nice and important point, maybe in geophysics or atmospheric physics. Um, so here, um, let, let me say that um, by making some assumptions, so let's say that the superposition size is roughly the same size as the distance between the two spheres, one has the following sensitivity. So uh, here I'm thinking again, masses of 10 to the minus 15 k kg. As we, let's say, increase the superposition size, we can um, uh, sense, begin to sense better and better uh, acceleration noises. So and ideally we want to arrive to this 10 to the minus 15 meter per second square or square root hertz, or in force sensitivity, this is 10 to the minus 30 Newton per square root hertz. So with this um, final message, uh, uh, I want to conclude. I also want to thank all of the, my collaborators. So Thomas, who was at the time was an, was an uh, amazing undergraduate student. Ryan, who's um, had the previous talk. Professor Mushu Kim, Professor Anupam Mazunar, and Professor Sugato Dose. With this, I conclude. Thank you, Marco. Um, that was a great talk. So. If anyone has questions, go ahead, Gavin. Um, hi there, great talk, thanks. Um, so um, with the problem of the gas atoms hitting the box, I guess that that could be solved just by not being in a drop tower and just by having the box attached to the ground in a lab um, and so then you're left with the gravity gradient noise. And so do you think that the stuff that Martin Planio was talking about could um, overcome the gravity gradient noise, like the motional dynamic decoupling and the, um, this idea of having two you know, copies of the whole experiment so that you can remove the effect of the distant um, noise sources? So, so I guess your question relates in part to this observation I made here that we're really talking about just the horizontal motion and one could have it, let's say, suspended and unconstrained along the horizontal motion. Uh, in that case, I guess um, um, the gravity gradient noise um, can be so the gravity gradient noise does not matter. It doesn't matter so much if the system is in free fall or it's fixed at a fixed height, because these are curvature effects. 
So th that will, for gravity gradient noise, um, the only, it, it's essentially a harmonic trap. So this term here, and it doesn't really matter if either if we even constrain the system or it's free to move left and right, or if it's the whole thing is vertically in free fall. So as far as gravity gradient noise, I think it's really enough to, um, uh, to isolate the experiment. If we, if we just want to sort of fix this term, uh, what, what was this, the question? So uh, the, about the, the, the other proposal, I, I, I have to understand it a bit better to make a comment about the gravity gradient, but I think it will, the gravity gradient noise is essentially unrelated to the fact if, if it's in free fall or not, it's a curvature effect. It's really coming from this, from the Riemann tensor. Or you can view it as from the Newtonian, one over our potential, which is also Newtonian space-time curvature. Was this uh, the question or? Not really, but we, we could talk about it in the, um, in the discussion session if you want. Yeah, Andy, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. So really nice talk, uh, Marco. So just a question about the, um, say the jittering noise from gas collisions in the box. So the experimental box, I, I guess, will be attached to whatever uh, Casimir screens or other me close magnets or whatever that we're using to control the dynamics. And have you considered the effect of the relative motion between the magnets and the Casimir screen in terms of producing random forces on the, on the interferometers? So here, um, everything is in um, here i'm picturing everything in free fall so essentially the casimir so the box can be maybe attached to the this box but it will be in free fall with the box um and everything essentially the magnets are also inside this box and so they will be all in free fall um, so as far as let's say the effect of this um the magnets this is taken into account in these equations so this will be and magnetic forces are in this term, but then amplify these other two terms. Um, so um, I, I, everything, so in short, yes, we have taken this thing into account. But so, what, yeah, just to clarify, so the, the box gets kicked by the gas outside, which moves the magnet because it's attached to the box, but that doesn't directly move the falling interferometer, right? It only sees the force from the magnet, right? Yes, yes, yes. So this was um, the point I was trying to say that the key, uh, the, the effect is really due to the momentum transfer between the magnets and the system. Uh, the fact that, so the, the dust particles are hitting the box, moving it around. The magnets are inside the box, also moving around. But this is this coupling between the magnets and the system that induces, that amplifies uh, these noises. And this is what you've considered, as well as the from the Casimir, I guess, yeah, effect. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Thomas again was also on the team for this paper, who was also the author of the paper on the the, sh the shielding of um, to the Casimir shielding paper. So um, I think this deserves further discussion in the panel discussion um, time, because yeah, I also have questions related to that. So, but for now, let's move to Jake's um, talk. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see my screen yeah. and hear. Wonderful. So uh, first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for putting together this week's really gravity extravaganza. And also uh, to my chair, Nancy, thank you so much for moderating today's session. Uh, my name is Jake Taylor. I'm at the Joint Quantum Institute and the Joint Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science, uh, which is between the University of Maryland in College Park and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And you can find me on Twitter at quantum underscore Jake. I'm talking today about a series of ideas that we have been working on for eight years now which connects to many of the things talked about in today's session, but also to the previous sessions and what comes in the future. And, you know, I'm going to lead with this sort of fundamental question we keep coming back to, which is what does make gravity quantum? So one part is the idea that there, we think there should exist 
a renormalizable theory of the metric fluctuations uh, that will recover Einstein's equations and is compatible with the standard model. So this is the effective field theory picture of gravity. And I feel like there's pretty strong agreement across multiple communities that both gravitons and gravitational waves are kind of the expected uh, quantum and classical theory of those nearly flat metric portions. But then there's a different question, which is what is a fundamental theory of gravity? Uh, is it a fundamental theory? Is it some emergent quantity? Is it even quantum? And in the second component, rather than assuming that there should be some effective field theory then trying to show it, we actually have to first establish that there are some fundamental aspects of gravity that are compatible with quantum mechanics. And of course, the one that has been zoomed in on uh, by myself and others is this question of does gravity actually entangle objects? And if not, what are the other potential interpretations of space time? So these are motivating questions, ones I think that drive us all. And of course, uh, in the panel, I hope that we can uh, dig into them if there are residual uh, concerns or ideas that we need to be thinking about there. So let's talk first just briefly about effective field theory tests. And so here you essentially say, let us assume that there are gravitons. And, and then in the sort of weak curvature regime, the flat regime, they're directly analogous to photons. And they are sort of very similar field theoretically. And you can start to calculate the very simple consequences. And one of these is the existence of gravitational decoherence. So the gravitational coupling constant is much like the fine structure constant uh, for electromagnetism, alpha here about 1 over 137, uh, though with many important corrections uh, that Jerry Gabriel mentioned. But there's also a similar constant uh, for gravity, which you could call the fine structure constant for gravity. And it's uh, given by the ratio of the electron mass to the Planck mass quantity squared. As you can imagine, that is a very small number, 10 to the minus 45 or so. But nonetheless, if you were to, for example, create a mechanical resonator with a quadrupolar moment, uh, it will decohere due to the emission of gravitons. And that decoherence rate goes as, just like in classical radiation theory, you have a decoherence rate or damping rate that goes as a fine structure constant. A prefactor here, because this is dipolar radiation of electric dipole compared to essentially a uh, electron charge and a wavelength squared, and then the overall frequency of the transition. Because in gravitational physics, it's a quadrupolar transition. It's the mass quadrupole compared to the wavelength to the fourth power. Uh, and here you have a frequency to the fifth power. What that means is, and this was mentioned, was it Monday, I think, uh, that in fact, if you want to look for these effects, you darn well better go to very high frequencies and large quadrupolar moments. But you're, you're fighting against 10 to the minus 45 in the front. And that's an awfully small quantity. So even if you go to nuclear masses or transitions in nuclei, where the frequencies are now at the sort of uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, terahertz, you, you still don't get to an appreciable value for this gravitational dephasing rate. You really have to go to extremely high temperature frequency and, and quadrupoles, uh, which may occur, for example, neutron stars, but still it'd be very hard to see. So I, I've kind of given up hope in seeing the effect of field theory tests. And I want to instead focus on what we can do here on Earth. And uh, one, one thing I found a little bit interesting is that we haven't really talked about why it's so hard to do these experiments on Earth. And from my perspective, and this goes back to a paper we wrote in uh, 2013 and a follow-up in, in 2014 with my old student, Tavir Caffrey, and then later with Jared Milburn, where if you ask, what, what can you do on Earth? It turns out that there's a very natural combination of the terrestrial unit, which is the material density N, and Newton's constant G, which ends up defining this gravitational coupling strings you can do for any quantum experiment that we here conceive on Earth. This quantity, by the way, for uh, densities at the order of uh, 20,000 kilograms per meters cubed, which is typical for uh, a dense metal, is at 10 to the minus three inverse seconds, so a millihertz. And I contend that this is a fundamental scale that governs any gravity experiments that we conceive on Earth. So if you look, for example, at the quantum mechanical coupling between two harmonic oscillators in the dipolar or quadrupolar limit, you have uh, their masses squared, the Newton's constant out front, the separation raised to the third power compared to their harmonic oscillator length, quantum harmonic oscillator length raised to the second power. And you can rewrite this now by using the definition of harmonic oscillator length of h bar, square root of h bar over two m omega as 
this g times the density, our zeta parameter here, and then our, the masses cancel and just h bar over omega. So what that tells you is that the energy of this interaction is, this, is basically bounded from above by zeta squared over omega with an h bar determined to energy. And that tells us that first of all, the experiments we generally conceive of will want to work with long harmonic oscillator lengths, so at low frequencies. And second of all, that everything is going to be extremely slow. So what is the prototypical experiment uh, that you can think of here? So uh, this dates back to, for me uh, to 2013, when I was challenged by Jack Harris at the DARPA meeting where we were looking at building high precision accelerometers, if there was anything that we could say about the quantum effects of gravity. And I thought long and hard with my student Devere about this. So everyone's kind of come to similar conclusions, uh, but the basic idea of course is that I have two harmonic oscillators with the gravitational coupling between them. I take the Newtonian interaction because I'm working at low curvatures and uh, uh, long time scales compared to the communication time between these two objects. I do an expansion for small displacements and I get this type of coupling. And now your question should really be, uh, first of all, can you build this type of experiment? Of course, the answer is, is yes. So this is a prototypical experiment you think of in this setting, which is the, the torsion balance experiment from Cavendish uh, here, upgraded to the modern era, in which you have a harmonic oscillator forming uh, oscillations ro rotationally here, another one just below it, some shielding between them to prevent a non-gravitational interaction, and then you're looking for coupling between these two objects. And so the question then becomes, is this coupling a uh, entangling interaction or not? And if you think heuristically, you can recall, and this was a point that raised several different times, that if you have a Lorentz invariant overall theory, then it has to be local. And a non-local force like Newtonian interactions arises from integrating out the, the virtual photons, if you will, or virtual gravitons. So, you know, very simply, if you think about a single mode of your virtual field, uh, of your, in this case, would be a graviton field, but whatever it may be, you can say, well, I've got a single mode has a frequency omega, and it has a coupling, a local coupling, uh, between this particle's position, and then also another local coupling over here between this particle's position. And when you talk about integrating out, we're really talking about making a unitary transformation of the problem, where the ratio of lambda over omega is taken to be very small, and where the time scales you're looking at are much slower than this scale omega, which is roughly the communication time between particle one and particle two. When you do that transformation, you get an effective term in which the, the free graviton has been removed. And what, what you recover is actually, first of all, a shift of the harmonic oscillator frequencies, but also an interaction between the two objects. So this, this is the interaction that we're thinking about, but you can also, if you think about it from a local theory perspective, you know there must be some object that mediates this interaction. And I think what's, what's kind of critical to understand is that uh, we talk about understanding is this interaction quantum, but we don't observe interactions, right? What we observe are channels. Who, and this is something that came up in Dan Carney's talk. I start with some state that I have controlled in my laboratory. I let it evolve for some period of time, and then I measure it. So the evolution for a period of time is, is a quantum channel. And that's actually what we're trying to observe. It is the metrology of that channel that determines what's happening to the system. So going back to the force law, you know, there's a virtual photon exchange back and forth between these two objects that leads to the Newtonian uh, or Coulombic interaction, if it's electromagnetism or gravity and inverse respectively. Uh, but this same channel picture, you could replace that channel with a different channel, which I call a screened channel. It's just an example case, but the whole point of the screened channel is that it allows the interaction to occur, but it adds just enough noise to prevent entanglement through that interaction. And in this paper from eight years ago, we basically said, well, what are the desiderata for any theory of an interaction of what we might call a force law that's gonna be compatible with what we observe in the macroscopic world, but that doesn't let entanglement through. And, and the compatibility, we essentially say is that it's gotta reproduce the classical dynamics. So in the Ehrenfest limit, in which you factorize expectation values, you should expect it to result in classical equations of motion that you would be measuring, but at the same time, we don't want it to let entanglement as in quantum information through. If that's the only constraints you put on this thing, it turns out that there are some strict bounds of what happens between these two harmonic oscillators. So 
you essentially want to confirm that there's an interaction, that it's interactions due to gravity. Then you have two harmonic oscillators with conjugate momentum, A and B, B, A and B, B. And then it doesn't matter what non-entangling channel you choose. These constraints mean that the variances of the momenta actually must grow in time. And so when we talk about having an entangling channel, one thing you want to do is directly show you have entanglement. But actually, it suffices to show that the consequences of a non-entangling channel are not observed. So if you do not see this heating, right, then you know, there actually exists a protocol by which you can take these two harmonic oscillators and from their interaction, create a purified entanglement that gets to arbitrary levels of entanglement. So uh, pure Bell states can be generated using this system. And I kind of like this idea because it, it, it reduces the experimental challenge of directly showing an entanglement witness to showing this indirect channel witness, which is really saying that I need to get my heating so low that I could try and see this. And if I don't see it, I now confirm that there actually is entanglement between these two systems generated. So it's an indirect type test, but actually quite powerful. And uh, at that time, we proposed a way to do this indirect test by essentially looking for heating between these two masses, keeping them very cold. Uh, the numbers are not very promising. So the, the sort of gravitationally induced heating, if the gravitational interaction is not entangling, is on the order of one phonon every 3,000 seconds or so. And there's a thermal background, which is much larger. So you need to integrate for very, very long times. Uh, it basically takes a millennia to do this type of experiment, even if you try to do it with some level of parallelism. And so I thought that was very interesting theoretically, uh, but it wasn't really compelling. And, uh, and so, you know, since then, there's been a lot of interesting motivation, and I really appreciate from uh, Blatko and also from uh, Sugato and, and, and all their co collaborators, these ideas of trying to get really more closely to direct entanglement witnesses. But uh, what I found really interesting is, is digging more into this question of, of what makes a channel entangling and how do you confirm that's entangling or not, and how do you confirm it's from gravity or not. And so more recently, We've developed uh, a test, and this is uh, similar in some respects to what Martin Plenio was talking about earlier this morning. Uh, we're developing a test where we're trying to measure entanglement induced via gravity, but rather than doing both of these objects, so both harmonic oscillators or both, uh, both of the interfer in arms of the interferometer, we'd like to actually only test one side. And in particular, that allows us to look at a very asymmetric protocol, which we have here an atom, uh, which is trapped, and a harmonic oscillator, which is a large, you know, nearly semi-classical mass. And so what you can conceive of here is that I take this atom and I have this mass. I do an atom interferometric motion on the atom, so I split it into two different pathways. Uh, we're considering, by the way, atom interferometers with very long hold times. And that is, can either be accomplished in free fall or uh, with our collaborator, Olga Miral at Berkeley, you can actually do it by trapping the atoms after they've hit their apex of motion and holding them there for actually tens of seconds. So you split them, you hold them. Now, the atom being on the left side means that this mass feels a force going to the left. Atom on the right side means this mass feels a force going to the right. And so over time, the mass starts oscillating out. Uh, and if you then try and recombine the atom to complete the interference signal, you get a oscillation of the probability of finding the atom state in the upstate at the end of this process. And that oscillation is due to the, uh, the gravity uh, gradient that the atom sees. But in addition, you see a collapse and revival of the overall interferometer's fringe. And the collapse and revival, so the collapse arises because this atom becomes entangled with this mass and this states no longer overlap, that reduces the coherence fringe. But you get revival for the same reason that Martin mentioned, which is that at, at a period of the harmonic oscillation, this initial force here actually has the system return to its initial state. So it is the harmonicity of the harmonic oscillator that gets you this revival. And uh, a key point here, uh, there's a constant I'm gonna use throughout the rest of this talk, which is a little lambda. This is the ratio of the gravitational coupling to the harmonic oscillator frequency. Uh, we can recast it in terms of my gravitational constant zeta uh, squared here. And then uh, the atomic mass, the separation between the two atoms, uh, and then this denominator here, which depends upon the big mass of the object M here. And the details of this are given in this archive paper if you want to see more of the gory stuff. <laughs>
And so uh, what do we do to prove something about the channel? Well, we had to prove a theorem and we're talking about a specific type of channel. So we're saying you have these two objects, uh, you observe that there's a, a you, sorry, you have one object, which is the harmonic oscillator and this other thing. And you're looking at the harmonic oscillator system. And you first of all require that the channel be a semigroup. So that is to say that it generates uh, time evolution according to a semigroup composition law, uh, which is what you expect for time translation invariant systems. And the second thing is that the dynamics of the system leads to a re collapse, but then also revival of, for example, um, the coherence that you could observe in system A. And if both of these are true, then you can prove that this channel is not a separable channel, so it conveys an angle. So uh, what's going on? Uh, so one way to think about this is uh, in a displaced picture. So I start here. Uh, essentially, the initial motion of the motion of the atoms produces an effective displacement on a harmonic oscillator. It moves for some amount, and then you move the atoms back, and that produces two different pathways: one for up, one for down. The overlap of the wave function for this pathway and this pathway. So pathway one is represented by delta. Pathway one is two is represented by minus delta. That overlap gives you a signal of collapse and revival, which goes like this. So here's our harmonic oscillator frequency, and here is our lambda parameter. And so this goes up and down, and that will be your look. You're looking for that revival. Uh, so what does that look like experimentally? The idea is that I have an atom interferometer. So this axis is time. This axis is space. Uh, this is the z-axis of space. I have this uh, sort of collection of masses that are suspended together as one harmonic oscillator that's allowed to go up and down. And the idea is that I have atoms sitting in the middle. I can kick them down or kick them up. And when I do that with a laser, kick them up or down, uh, they get to an apex of their motion here. And in that, in that motional apex, they actually can be trapped because they have a zero uh, vertical velocity at that point. And you can hold them uh, with an optical lattice for a period of time, tau, which allows for long hold times, even in Earth's gravity without a free fall experiment. So again, Holgers has demonstrated this for about 20 seconds now and still sees uh, coherence on the other side. And then you let it recombine. So this is a, a held interferometer. Uh, the idea is that this will leave these masses moving up and down and you look for collapse and revival. I will say, by the way, that the fundamental parameter we need is this uh, K parameter. Uh, and K squared has all these scalings. This is density. This is G Newton. This is the mass of the atoms. This is the temperature of this harmonic oscillator system, surprisingly. And we'll talk about that in a moment. This does better the hotter the masses are until you get to nonlinearities of the harmonic motion. Uh, it does require high Q, which, will, which is a different thing. So this is a little bit like what Martin was mentioning before, that it's okay to be thermal as long as you don't get decoherence from being thermal. And that's something that it shows up here as well. And then there's this denominator where the length shows up and uh, this frequency scale shows up. And so when you put it all together, uh, you find that in principle, if you can do 10 to the four experiments, each one with 10 to the seven atoms in the interferometer, it would take about two months to achieve a five sigma variant uh, validation. I'm gonna dig now into the details of that, but I just wanna say like, this is the most feasible experiment that I've ever been able to conceive of in this space. So I'm very excited, okay. So uh, let's just spend the last five minutes now talking about some of the other effects. Um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Right. So first of all, uh, I mentioned that the mass can be hot. So what happens when the mass is hot? So your initial state isn't at the origin, it's at some displaced value and you have a distribution mixture of these different displaced values. And maybe not surprisingly, when I start with a high momentum and then I give the system a kick, uh, it gets a larger energy because, or. Uh, uh, if you think of the change in kinetic energy, it's P plus P prime quantity squared. And if the, the kick P prime is, is not so big, but P is large, the overall energy change is large. What that means is at high temperature, the collapse is much stronger. So rather than going as uh, just lambda squared, eight lambda squared, it goes eight lambda squared times twice the occupation number. And that one, of course, is the quantum effect. There's also atomic defacing, which reduces the visibility. So here's this reduction in visibility. This, how far you go actually gets worse and worse and worse the hotter the system is. But then it will actually come back. Uh, first of all, atomic defacing is not very good because that will, that will overall damp this curve. So you, that's gonna be a problem. But in addition, because of the heating and cooling of the mass, the fact that there's a, a phonons hopping on and off changes the effective phase oscillation of this, of this resonator. And consequently, I get a reduction in visibility given by the same quantity, but divided by the Q factor. 
of the resonator. So you need a reasonably high Q. It turns out not more, it's not super high Q, it's on the order of 10,000. And so it's quite achievable for a wide variety of harmonic oscillators, but you do need high Q and you need good atomic coherence. The other problem though, is that this signature is actually uh, goes as lambda squared. So it's quadratic in the Newton constant. And that's horrible because that's really small. So a neat idea that's de described in this paper is actually that you can, instead of trying to do the whole experiment with gravity, you can cheat. And in fact, you can change the initial state, uh, which is really trying to just maximize the quantum fissure information for this channel by pre-entangling the mass in the atoms. So what you do is you entangle, here's with an electromagnetic interaction, for example, uh, or uh, induced by using different magnetic levels of the atom, uh, coupled to the, uh, to the mass, and then you disentangle, so you turn that off by changing the internal state of the atom, then you disentangle with gravity. And that will be sufficient, surprisingly, to show that gravity's interaction is an entangling interaction. So that's kind of uh, very neat because that takes you from lambda to lambda squared to lambda, and that, that's how we get to the sort of two month figure for integration time. I know I'm pretty much out of time. I just want to mention that here are some you know, uh, parameter plots as a function of the temperature of the, the mass. It's hard to get a temperature of, above uh, sort of a thousand effective Kelvin. Now people, by the way, make a thousand Kelvin mechanical motion, right? It's just an answer of how big is the white noise on this oscillator. But at some point it becomes so large that it starts to disturb the experiment and, and the linearity assumptions that you've made. And then here's how long the hold time is. So you're looking for this uh, boosted delta V to be as large as you can. And this is a log 10 scale here. So you're kind of looking at least in this range, but you can see that you know if you can get hold times that are about a factor of 10 larger than we have today, and at this sort of range of temperatures is quite achievable. And so we're very excited uh, about the set of prospects. A uh, last point, uh, you can also make the harmonical, the whole system actually much higher frequency by taking advantage of the ability to do a sort of spin echo type sequence in which you switch whether the atoms are in the top well or bottom well of that harmonic oscillator, of that holding potential. And that allows you to uh, make many, many cycles of this if you're working at high frequency, uh, which is a sort of spin echo type sequence and can remove some low frequency noise. So I'm gonna spend the last moment here to just mention, there's a lot that's going to go wrong, right? So one thing is the non-gravitational interactions, which can be a benefit, but you have to control them very well. So you really need to be clear about what's gravity, what's not. Um, there's a bunch of issues with atomic defacing, which we have to get better at, and deviations from harmonicity and other mean field effects. We believe these are all uh, surmountable. And then there's the question of the loopholes. So what are the non-gravitational interactions? How do you confirm that you actually have gravity as a, as a feature in the channel? Uh, what about this time translation invariance that we talked about? Uh, that's not something that typically happens when you do an experiment. You have specific things that violate that. How can we do better there? And then there's also a question about non-locality, right? We're talking about a very long interaction times, a relative to communication times. And so there's a bunch of hidden variable models that could be explaining the entanglement. And, and so you can imagine this is your first test, but it is only your first test. There's many tests to come. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to take a moment to thank uh, my group, in particular, uh, Dan Carney, uh, who's been uh, my strongest lead in this effort and a wonderful ally in what we're trying to get done, along with my students, Suchi Gosh and John Kunyaman. Uh, and then uh, my new postdoc, Jeff Jeffrey Epstein, who's uh, taking up some of the lead now that Dan is in his new position. Uh, I want to quickly that. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Jake. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I see a few hands up. So, Ron, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jake, for really a really interesting talk. Um, can you say a few words about um, uh, the uncertainty in the position of the pendulum uh, in this uh, experiment that you talked about with Holger Muller? Um, kind of um, noise would that perhaps uh, uh, put into the evolution or in the entanglement? So actually, the the point of this um, this n bar that you see in this equation here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm saying, uh, let us let the initial state of the pendulum be that of a harmonic oscillator temperature T with an occupation number n bar. Mm -hmm. So if, if you think about uh, an uncertainty in the initial position of the harmonic oscillator, you can always bound that with a thermal state with a similar uncertainty. So I guess the way I would say it is that we actually anticipate that there's some uncertainty of where this oscillator is. And in fact, that leads to a, a dramatic reduction of coherence in, the, in the, this portion down here. 
On the other hand, it doesn't change the revival value. It is in, instead the change in the uncertainty of the position due to some quantum effects of the phonons being added or subtracted or other noise that will lead to a reduction in the revival. And that not only includes the sort of quantum mechanical dephasing, which I've included here, but it also includes things which are a bit more pernicious, like for example, parametric changes in the resonance frequency of the pendulum. So this is where the bigger issue is that as you lose knowledge of where the pendulum starts, you actually also lose knowledge of what its frequency is because everything we actually construct is slightly nonlinear. Um, and you lose knowledge of, of how the atom sits relative to the position of that object, which means that you get corrections to your phase that you're expecting. So I worry about getting the pendulum in the wrong spot, but it turns out that I worry about it at, at the order of a wavelength of light. So on the order of, uh, of a micron, not on the order of the size of an atom or, or much smaller. I hope that's a, a, enough at least to get started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, to be clear, this n bar is from the initial configuration and this, this reduction of the revival is from the change due to thermal effects. So the change from the beginning of the experiment till the, the measurement time. Okay, thanks. On a pump. Oh, hi, Jake. Uh, very nice talk. I enjoyed it. So I, I was, I'm just trying to understand. So in your 2013 paper where you were, um, um, you just mentioned about this entanglement, where did the entanglement due to graviton comes in? Maybe I'm missing something. So it's a, it's a counterfactual rather than a factual. So the idea here is that um, I'm saying, let, it, let the two masses, the two uh, harmonic oscillators interact via gravity but have that have the interaction be a non-entangling channel, okay? So some theory of gravity that doesn't entangle. I don't know what it is, we can talk about that, but let's say that theory existed. If that is true, then you find anomalous heating of the two harmonic oscillators. So what you do is you show the anomalous heating doesn't exist and that requires that the channel be entangling. But, so it's uh, a possibility. Yeah, um, Andy, do you want to go ahead? Thanks. Yeah, really nice talk, Jake. Uh, so just a question. Can you do any better by actively driving the oscillator rather than just relying on thermal excitations? Like, let's say I applied some arbitrary excitation or something. So uh, so we're thinking a lot about that. And so uh, going back to the loophole table, which take me a second. Um, so I think the easiest, the easiest first experiment is in fact that you take this harmonic oscillator and you drive it with white noise, which is, which is close to the stationarity assumption, right? So white noise, so we're actually in the process of trying to prove something about the addition of, of adding white noise. Because with white noise, I can take a harmonic oscillator, which is cold, because I want a cold apparatus, I want high, high vacuum, all these things, and effectively put it at a high thermal occupation number. So that's indeed what our what our, our kind of idea is there. So yeah, that's that's the way you go if you want to get to large effective occupations. And I think we're, our goal is to actually not so much be limited by the theory, but to be limited by nonlinear effects. So that means motions of no more than a micron uh, vertically from the white noise. Thanks. Okay, I think um, so. Gato, maybe in the interest of time, we can take your question in the panel discussion time. Sure. 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 Okay. Um, let's uh, move to Igor. Thanks a lot, Jake. Okay. All right, Igor, take it away. Hi. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you can see my screen and. Uh, yep. We can see it. your screen and you. Yep. Okay. Great. And me even. Great, that's fixed. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, yes, and I wanna thank uh, Anupam, Andrew and Sugado for inviting me and for this really great conference. Uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun, actually even too much fun, it's too interesting. So I'm, I'm so exhausted after this long day, I'm sure you are as well. Um, so um, yeah, let's, uh, yeah. Let, let's hope uh, it works well the last half hour and then have a nice discussion. Um, so my background is in quantum optics and quantum information theory, um, and I'm also interested uh, both in quantum sensing uh, 
uh, but also in the interface with gravity. Um, and uh, that's a relatively broad interest. Uh, and I think there's many interesting aspects uh, to explore both in terms of quantum gravity, speculative theories, and just novel effects due to metrology. Um, and so uh, just to give a very brief overview, uh, there is different aspects of uh, low energy quantum physics where quantum optics and quantum information are kind of rooted um, and gravity. And so there's many effects which are interesting without the need uh, to go to high energy sort of quantum field theory description, even though there's nothing wrong with it, but then these effects become much more clear at low energies. So one aspect, of course, are simulators and analog systems directly relevant to experiments. Um, and so there's many interesting results there. Um, and another uh, straightforward aspect is high precision measurement. And so using quantum systems and quantum control in order to make better tools. And these tools allow us to uh, better measure gravity or other forces, as you know, we'll hear also We'll hear from Andrew, but um, also heard from uh, uh, Gerald Gabrielsen and so forth. So high precision measurements are very interesting to try and discover possible uh, new physics or confirm uh, physics as we know. And there's other interesting aspects, maybe even from a theoretical side, uh, where I think there's some surprising overlap. For example, looking at quantum optics uh, tools, mechanisms, and intuition, and apply to cosmology. And so there are some interesting uh, outcomes there and some interesting effects. Um, uh, of course, it's very popular these days to also use quantum information tools to better understand quantum gravity, emergence of space-time, uh, through a better understanding of entanglement and many-body physics, for example. Um, and then finally, there's uh, other aspects such as quantum gravity phenomenology, which is really, I think, the core of this conference and the most exciting part. Um, and that can be, in Carlo Rovelli's terms, uh, both speculative effects, so some effects that you know are maybe postulated to appear, such as maybe uh, gradation induced collapse or other effects, or it could be also effects that we are expecting from physics as we know, but in a new regime, such as gravitation-induced entanglement. Um, and then finally, there is also another aspect, which is a quantum dynamics on curved space-time. So that's kind of a direct analog of a quantum field theory on curved space-time, except for we look at probe particles and systems, uh, which are well described in non-relativistic physics, but we place them on a post-Newtonian background. And there's new effects that arise there. Okay, and so in this talk, uh, it, you know, the, the 20 minutes or so of what I have, I, I will try to uh, make some kind of uh, Swedish type uh, smörgåsbord, uh, which is a collection of many uh, little different things, and then try to see uh, if, if that gives a little flair of uh, different topics. And so I'm gonna um, just present some results uh, uh, that uh, are uh, on this interface that I showed before. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm happy to discuss in more detail uh, at some other occasion or in the discussion. So um, first I'll talk a little bit about gravitational wave detection with atomic clocks. So that goes into the uh, metrology with quantum systems. Uh, then I'll say a few words on tabletop tests of uh, specific speculative quantum gravity models. Uh, so here, uh, of course, the emphasis on speculative, namely, this may be new physics, uh, but some people expect this to happen. Uh, and so these tests uh, we proposed uh, to do with uh, optomechanical systems. Um, and then I'll say a few words on non-speculative new effects, which is a tangulation induced entanglement and decoherence in matter wave interferometry. So that is in the, uh, in the category of uh, um, quantum probe systems on a post newtonian background. Finally, I hope I have a, a, a little bit of time, one minute, and I'll uh, say uh, just a few words on a very recent result that we had uh, on squeezing of axions, and that is applying quantum optics tools to better understand dark matter, and that it turns out there's actually a very strong quantum effects present. Okay, so let me start with uh, atomic clock uh, measurements of gravitational waves. So this is this category here. Um, basically, what we looked at with our collaborators, uh, most experimental collaborators, uh, was to look at how this uh, ultimately very, very strong precision of atomic clocks and projected future precision could potentially be used for metrology uh, of interesting gravitational effects. And so we focused on gravitational wave detection, and that was before LIGO actually had detected gravitational waves. Uh, so that was... Um, uh, you know, just kind of speculative at that time. Um, and basically what we showed is that you can just as well use atoms um, instead of uh, uh, photons or, or interferometry in order to have some type of competitive uh, gravitational wave detector with slightly different um, 
uh, features. So it's a tunable detector and, and it could be interesting for space-based application. Uh, so let me briefly show how that works. Uh, so basically, we, we already heard, of course, about gravitational waves, many things, and um, and Molik's fantastic talk. Uh, he started with the uh, geodesic deviation equation, which is perfectly fine and, and very good. Uh, but uh, more generally, when we don't want to be at short distances, so very close geodesics, uh, one can use the full uh, metric uh, to just, for example, compute how a null curve uh, is uh, affected by gravitational waves. So basically, how a photon propagates in a background where there's a gravitational wave. And so a, uh, a photon would propagate a distance d between two points a and b in flat space, but because of the presence of the gravitational wave, uh, there is these additional terms which appear uh, where you know, the derivatives of them is precisely this gravitational wave amplitude. And so the effective distance of the photon uh, uh, travel is, is different. Or in other words, the affected travel, affecting travel time is different. And you can detect that by a phase shift. So if you, uh, if you just compare the photon uh, to the same path in a different direction, you'll see a phase shift. And you need two arms uh, to detect it, uh, to get, mainly to get rid of noise. There is common phase noise that uh, is very, very strong. But because it's common to both arms, uh, you, uh, uh, you differentiate it away. So that's similar to the technique as Martin, for example, mentioned in this very interesting uh, proposal with similar spirit. So uh, the more the more common formula is if we approximate it for small uh, distances compared to gradation wavelength, then it's this uh, strain sensitivity, which is directly proportional to. Uh, Right. Now, for atomic clocks, it's the same thing, except it's a slightly different type of detection mechanism. So the idea here, what we have is uh, to have uh, also space-based detector, and you have two clocks, A and B, far away from each other, and each clock just uh, uh, measure time with respect to a local laser. But then you face lock the lasers to each other uh, through a photon link. And on this photon link, there will be again imprinted this type of uh, effect on the gravitational wave of the gravitational wave. And effectively, uh, what it will do to these clocks is that there is an effective Doppler shift between them. So you can do a differential measurement between them. Uh, so you do correlated spectroscopy between those uh, both clocks. And this differential measurement will reveal if there's a Doppler shift between them or not. And that is the signal for an atomic clock. And now the signal uh, now is proportional to delta nu over nu instead of delta L over L. Uh, but um, it's also, of course, directly proportional to the gravitational wave amplitude, and then it has these two factors. And the first factor is due to the baseline. Uh, and so, you know, here is when the baseline is small, then it is just linear, uh, but this is the transfer function uh, depending on what frequency is compared to the baseline. So you choose a big baseline, million kilometers or so, and it gives you the best frequency at which you are, uh, you know, that's uh, half the gravitational wave uh, wavelength, which is uh, an ideal. And then there's a second factor, and that is special about this clock function, uh, for, uh, clock use. Namely, uh, this se second factor comes from the type of uh, measurement that you're actually doing. Uh, so this thing is a you know, measurement like a Ramsey sequence, but you can change this transfer function depending on what type of measurement technique you're applying on your clocks. So you can effectively change and tune the second function, which is very important. Um, and so Basically, what you get, uh, your atoms are fundamentally limited by atom projection noise, uh, which is square root of one and of atoms. So not shot noise, but projection noise. And so you get a specific noise floor. But then, uh, you know, if you do a Ramsey sequence, there's specific frequency here at which you're ideally sensitive. But then if you apply a different sequence like dynamical decoupling, uh, which is a quantum control sequence, uh, then you can tune effectively your sensitivity window to a different wavelength at which you're ideally sensitive. But you get a very, very narrow bandwidth detected. And so it gives you a nice tunable detector. And here for some projected numbers in the future of a million atoms someday, if you want to have them, uh, then it could be a, a competitive type of detector. And so here is just on this plot, it's comparing it to uh, Lisa and LIGO, this range. So it could be a, a complementary type of detector. And just as a small side note, uh, there's a different work uh, with uh, my um, collaborators, Keith Schwab, uh, Swati Singh, and uh, uh, Laura De Lorenzo, where we looked at an optomechanical tunable detector using superfluid helium, uh, a slightly different type of quantum system, but similarly, you get also a tunable detector, which is very nice, narrow band, uh, and in this high frequency range. Okay, so that was uh, kind of for the metrology application. So now switching gears, um, uh, but basically what it shows is that using novel quantum technologies, there are some interesting new uh, openings uh, to test gravity, uh, or at least classical gravity here. Uh, and now let me switch gears and look at quantum gravity phenomenology, and in particular at one specific proposal that we focused on uh, now 
uh, you know, a few years ago. And this particular proposal uh, is the so-called uh, modified uncertainty principle, which has been floating around for many years uh, prior to that uh, in the community. So of course, we don't have a complete theory of quantum gravity. And so we also don't have you know, full predictions for all scales uh, that we can just derive. Uh, and uh, you know, there are some things we know at the linearized uh, low energy limit, which can be of course derived, but there's also speculation of how some possible effects that we expect might be incorporated into uh, quantum physics as we know. And in particular, there's many Gedanken experiments and also many um, uh, reasonings, even results, I think, in string theory that suggest uh, that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is actually modified at very, very short scales. And this modification looks like that. It also goes sometimes as GOP. And basically, uh, it has the following features. Uh, so what you see here is the minimal uncertainty curve in red, according to normal quantum mechanics, and in blue, according to these uh, speculative theories. Um, and in these blue ones, what appears is there is a minimal length scale that appears. And that's really the core of the, of the argument. Namely, there's a minimal physical length before below which uh, no measurement or even physical process makes sense. And this is the Planck length times this uh, square root of this free parameter of these models. So one can just take it as a free parameter and restrict it uh, from experiments. Um, and phenomenologically, so this seems to be, there are good reasons to believe that. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have strong opinions about it, but there's good reasons at least uh, for that. But then phenomenologically, one can incorporate that into quantum theory as we know it by changing the algebraic structure of the theory. And so that is kind of the next step. That's kind of a phenomenological modification of quantum mechanics. And people have done that. And there's many different, there's a whole zoo of different proposals uh, how commutator could potentially change. Uh, in, from the 90s and so forth. And so there's different changes where you basically have the quantum mechanical prediction for these quadratures plus some small corrections, where it's kind of momentum compared to the Planck moment. And just to give you some numbers, if one takes ions in the harmonic trap, for example, for typical numbers, this correction is like 60 orders of magnitude smaller than the quantum predictions. And even for optomechanics, it's uh, you know also maybe higher masses, different parameter range, still it's 40 orders of magnitude away from, from the quantum prediction, so it's very small. And so as of 10 years ago, the experimental bounds were pretty bad, uh, but, but they were interesting nevertheless. Uh, so you know, one, can, one can just take it as a free parameter and restrict it. Uh, and so what we suggested was uh, to actually try and do a better experiment um, under some uh, additional conditions, namely assuming that we can do it with a quantum system uh, of the center of mass motion of the system. And the basic idea was to use um, a protocol that is well known in a quantum information science. And that is based on displacements of a system um, and that this induces an additional phase shift if one has different displacements. So basically, if we have some system, uh, no matter what it is, and then we change its position and momentum, the mean position and momentum, this is uh, described by the displacement operator. And if you do several displacements subsequently, uh, the displacements operators don't commute. And so one gets also additional phase shifts. And in particular, one can do it around the loop, a type of geometric phase uh, in, in continuous variable systems. And then if one does that, the system doesn't change. So you can apply it to any state, no matter what state it is. But overall, you get an overall phase, uh, which is dependent on the area that you enclose in phase space. And this arises precisely because of the non-commutativity of position and momentum. And this is well known and has actually been implemented as a phase gate for ions. So this is a global phase here, but you can make it a relative phase and then it's uh, imported. Okay, and so a similar spirit, uh, we looked at optomechanical systems in a pulsed regime. So optomechanics, uh, you know, just uh, it's it's kind of a mechanical massive uh, mirror which is interacting with an optical cavity field here in red. And then uh, one can apply this Hamiltonian in a pulsed regime where only the interaction regime matters. And if one has four, sub subsequent, four subsequent interactions with different quadratures of the mechanics, then one implements precisely this type of phase gate that I talked about. And keeping it very general, we can keep just the commutation relation between the canonical uh, uh, operate, uh, um, canonical, uh, 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 sorry, position and momentum of the mechanics completely general. And so then one gets this kind of general uh, displacement, which now couples the optical field to higher nonlinear power to these different uh, uh, commutator higher order modifications. So in quantum mechanics, this gives just a self-curve non-linearity on the light, 
But in this alternative theories, one gets additional effects, uh, which uh, also scale differently to higher order with the amount of photons. One can scale it up with many photons. So it's an, using an ancillary system to indirectly uh, try and probe for this kind of effective additional uh, anomalous phase. So one can look at just the phase of the light and then look if there is an anomalous phase. On it. So it's still, of course, extremely challenging, but we show that, okay, with some you know, some difficult but maybe achievable parameters, one could even constrain these type of models down to uh, uh, this kind of beta not be on the order of one, which would correspond to a Planck scale effect if applied to the center of mass. There's a somewhat related proposal by Jacob Beckenstein at the time as well about some interesting effects might take place at these scales. Okay, and then uh, I don't have much time, so I just very briefly run over. There is, of course, challenges and there's Technical challenges, mainly it's nonlinearities, harmonic uh, unharmonicities, and they have very similar signatures. And uh, Martin Plenio and his student, uh, they had an interesting idea of uh, trying and kind of uh, cancel some of this for some proposals by using a more uh, more loops. Um, you know, one can also turn it around use it for metrology. But there's also some conceptual questions because we're talking about some phenomenological theory. Namely, there is a question mark of how does one actually apply these systems? Because in quantum mechanics, it doesn't matter what uh, you know wave function, what system it describes. Uh, but here, it matters if you apply these modifications on the individual level of the part particles or on the collective degree of freedom. And so there's some ambiguity there. And okay, one can try to increase the effect uh, to see how it is, or one can look at, for example, a quantum signature only by speculating it's only on the quantum level. Or also party Plenio in a different paper recently suggested maybe to parameterize this additional uncertainty um, with an additional parameter and then make kind of a two parameter uh, uh, plot and see what experiments can restrict it. Okay, um, all right, and just to mention, okay, there's been a few experiments in the classical domain where people have uh, restricted these parameters now better since then by looking at uh, these type of effective nonlinearities. Uh, and this is interesting and, and very nice. But again, this is all currently in the classical regime. And there's also some work that suggests if you apply these deformations classically, there's also other constraints already there. So it seems, you know, you know that there is maybe some quantumness that is required, like, as, like in our proposal. All right, uh, but uh, to shift gears now uh, in the last, uh, last part, uh, uh, the unrelated different uh, topic I want to discuss here now and the rest of it, except for the last slide on the squeezing of axions. Uh, here I want to now talk a little bit about uh, time dilation and how that affects uh, quantum interferometry. And so that is shifting gears from a speculative model that we want to constrain or probe uh, to actually just predictions of physics as we know it, uh, but something that has been overlooked. And it's an interesting effect, which even has uh, uh, experimental consequences, uh, which are very, uh, uh, very soon achievable. So in particular, what we looked at is a variation of matter wave interferometry as we have today. And the variation is to look at the so-called quantum twin paradox. Uh, so we all know the twin paradox, which is if you have two twins, there's nothing paradoxical about it, but if you have two twins and one goes to space or at a higher altitude, and then they meet again, they, they have different age. Um, and so the quantum version is if you have a single system, but you place it in superposition at two different heights. And so gravitational time dilation causes the clock to tick differently at different heights. Uh, and so if you have a clock system that can measure time, you delocalize it, then the time will be different of these internal states. But now the prediction from quantum mechanics is if you have any states available that can tell you, distinguish these paths, uh, then you get a change if your interference pattern, namely you get a wash out a change of the visibility. So this is the quantum complementarity principle. So just from this cartoon, one can see that there is an effect which takes place, which does not take place if one doesn't have clocks. So a normal matter wave would just normally interfere and maybe get an additional phase shift from um, uh, from uh, uh, the gravitational potential, maybe even post-Newtonian potential. But if you have time dilation, if you measure really proper time of the system and the system keeps track of it along each path, you get an additional effect, which is this breakdown of interference. So the, the kind of the bottom line of this effect is we create a superposition of a clock being older and younger than oneself. And the prediction is that this changes path coherence. And that would be the signature of this uh, uh, post-Newtonian effect. And it's different from both graviton interaction or kind of decoherence due to gravitons. And it's also different from just normal matter wave interferometry when one looks at the phase shift. It's an additional effect of gravity which kicks in. 
And so how does it work? Uh, basically, it's very simple to see, even without much mathematics. Uh, if you have two clocks, okay, then each one of these clock states, it could be two level atoms, are described in terms of their evolution with respect to some local Hamiltonian h naught. And at different heights, they take at different proper times. Okay, so this is well tested. Every experiment tests this. Uh, we take an atomic clock here, it ticks with proper time one, and we take an atomic clock further up and it ticks at a different proper time. Okay, so all tests of the gravitational redshift are of this form. Now, according to quantum mechanics, we know that we can just superpose those two uh, because of linearity of quantum mechanics. And that's, that's the whole effect. Namely, we take this, uh, if you take two paths, then these clocks will be in superposition of either taking at uh, tau one or tau two, depending on what path they take. So your effective wave function is not just simply a superposition of two paths with a relative phase, but it's now an entangled state uh, to these internal degrees of freedom. So it only appears if you have additional degrees of freedom, which actually evolve with respect to proper time. So you get this additional uh, entangling effect between path and internal degrees of freedom. Okay, and then if you trace out the internal ones, so we don't even measure them, we're just left over with the visibility, so the coherence of our uh, interference pattern, and that's just given by this overlap of these internal states. So, and this we can generally describe as this expectation value uh, of, um, of this different unitaries with respect to different proper times. So in other words, there's an effect taking place if and only if there is some internal dynamics, uh, so not eigenstates of the internal Hamilton, but some dynamics, and if there is some proper time difference. So any two paths which have the same proper time, the effect of course doesn't kick in. So it's just, it's literally just a quantum version of the normal time dilation. And the only difference is now we're looking at amplitudes instead of two different individual systems. And so if one takes a two level system, the prediction is that the coherence at certain times will drop to zero and at other times it will completely revive. Uh, and so this is the signature of this post-Newtonian effect in quantum interferometry, which goes beyond the normal Newtonian physics, and which is not described by just adding a potential. So it's not described by just changing the delta phi with post-Newtonian potentials. It's a it, it's an effect which entangles your internal states. Okay, and so one can do it for periodic clocks. Then one has this revival. Uh, one can also do it for uh, uh, you know mixture of different clocks, and then there's you know much more complicated mixture and dephasing such that you effectively don't get any revival anymore. And this is relevant for like mixed states if they're uh, thermal states or so. Uh, you can also do it for photons in principle if one wants to do a photonic version of this. I think it was mentioned briefly. It's like a photonic cow experiment basically, and that takes place because of the Shapiro delay, not because of the time dilation. Okay, and I think I'm running a little bit of time. I'll just skip this very quickly. Uh, so, like I said, for mixtures of systems, not for single clocks, but many, many different uh, uh, clocks, effectively composite systems, consisting of many atoms, if they're thermal, you get an effective decoherence effect. And, and one can actually easily derive it using this formalism. Um, and so if one has a superposition of these molecules, I took here Marcus Arndt's molecules, but they have to be more, more complex than that, then effectively the thermal vibrations are also time dilated. And so this will decohere your system. And again, this decoherence is not because of scattering with some external environment. It's within quantum mechanics fully, it's just normal decoherence, but it's because time dilation couples internal states to the world lines on which the systems are on. Okay, and then one gets a decoherence time scale, uh, which is proportional to the temperature of the systems uh, and the complexity, but otherwise it's you know, an interesting effect because it combines relativity, quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, and gravity in this particular instance. Okay, and just to give some numbers, uh, this decoherence is interesting and I think conceptually nice, uh, uh, but it's of course weak. Uh, so if for mic you know, micrometer scale objects on earth at room temperature, if one creates also micrometer scale separations, uh, then it will decohere of something like on a millisecond uh, for vertical separations, micrometer scale. So not horizontal, but vertical. So these are kind of mesoscopic numbers uh, and you know, they might be even relevant for, for these type of experiments people are aiming for, but it's of course far from current experimental possibilities. But much more closer are these two level uh, systems because it depends, the effect depends directly on how good your clocks are. So what's the frequency of your systems? Uh, and so that will then um, uh, 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 be, closer to experimentally achievable if one compares, for example, to atomic fountains. So atomic fountains are about one to two orders of magnitude away from this effect being relevant. 
And so maybe next generation atomic fountains, which are maybe 10 meter separation, if they additionally have also internal transitions, which are along each path uh, oscillating, then this effect would kick in as well, if there's a proper time difference. So, so you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite uh, positive that this effect will be seen. And the interesting thing of it is a bit like Carlos said, it is not a speculative model. It's more to see that actually gravity can be added to the Schrodinger evolution in the way we expect. Uh, so, you know, this is just the limit of the full minimal coupling from, uh, you know, from how we expect gravity. But this is now uh, the metric part of it. So this beyond the Newtonian limit. And so we see how time dilation would affect really the dynamics of quantum systems. And there's a new effect which does not appear classical. Okay, uh, right. And so there are some interesting experiments like Holger Müller's experiments that was just mentioned by Jake, uh, where you hold actually atoms at 20 seconds for superposition, precisely what you need here. So if you could make this uh, superposition a bit larger, they kept, the effect would kick in. And uh, also Yair, of course, he had a fantastic work where they simulated this effect uh, with a, a magnetic field in homogeneous one, simulating time dilation, and they saw exactly these predictions. Um, right, and this 10 meter fountains could be then interesting in the future. And if I now finally have uh, last uh, two minutes, uh, then I just want to say also a few words about something a little bit different, but I think it's quite interesting because it also depends on gravity and quantum optics here, namely uh, how quantum effects are actually, quantum optics effects by, by potentially be relevant in cosmology as well. So again, finally shifting gears to the last thing. Uh, namely, what we looked at are axion-like dark matter candidates. Um, and so this is also a bit inspired by kind of proximity of course of Frank Bilchik here in Stockholm. Um, and uh, axion-like dark matter particles have been you know, postulated to be very interesting and feasible dark matter candidates many years ago, uh, but uh, they could be QCD scale, uh, but they could also have other masses. And this is generally known as light dark matter candidates. Now, these dark matter candidates are usually described as a scalar field. And this is because they have a lot of large occupancies. So it's very similar to a cold atoms in the BEC. And in fact, the description is the same. So one obtains uh, a gross pitayevsky type equation for the scalar field, uh, which is sourced uh, by you know, the gravitational uh, uh, kind of interaction here between themselves. Now, this classical field description is very powerful, uh, and uh, what usually this, this uh, arises using the Hartree ansatz. Uh, so one says that okay, this uh, BEC here wave function is actually consisting of um, you know a very large occupation of a mode, and this kind of uh, you know uh, these fluctuations due to a we can neglect because we have so 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 many particles. So effectively, just assuming we have a coherent state, so we have effectively a classical description of our field. So this is the typical gross pitayevsky uh, type approach to first order. And this gives very nice results, like a numerical results, which reproduce uh, CDM calculations very nicely. So this is kind of a, a dark matter structure of galaxies in class 2 theory. But what we looked at is that actually neglecting this, COVID, uh, this operator here uh, is actually not fully justified. Because if one looks at the full description, it turns out that even if you start with a coherent state and your fluctuations are very small compared to the square root n occupation, it turns out that there is actually an interesting effect that takes place on this operator, namely their squeezing due to these gravitational self-interactions. And the reason for that is because the equation one obtains for this uh, uh, operator is actually exactly the same as the self curve oscillator that we know from quantum optics. And we know from self curve oscillator that if one waits long enough, you even get giant superposition states. But even long before that, uh, it starts generating squeezing. Um, and so this is actually what happens here, that if you start with a coherent state, and this is continuously always uh, taking place, this um, evolution, you actually all the time generate extremely large squeezing uh, when you uh, even plug in these cosmological numbers. And so we looked at three different cases uh, in the cosmological numbers, uh, galactic cores, and also haloscopes. So these are small detectors, Earth-based detectors of a meter scale, even centimeter scale. What one can find is that the squeezing is actually generated uh, on just microsecond scales, extremely short time scales. 
uh, and it's continuously regenerated. And so it depends, of course, on the mass of the axion, but for any mass of this light matter particle, it is actually very, very short time scales. And you can get up to gigantic squeezing. So this is e to the 36. So this is like 15 orders of magnitude of vacuum uh, enhancement. Uh, of the noise. So you can get huge enhancements of the vacuum noise, even though you assumed initially that you have a purely classical state. So it's no longer the case. And so there's an interesting, uh, I think it's an interesting uh, observation that you actually have this quantum effect that uh, accompanies what you assumed was a classical description, and it can uh, reach enormously high values. So uh, uh, this is something we just put on the archive a week ago. And, and just to mention, uh, there's of course similar results also for cold atoms, uh, uh, where uh, people have calculated something very similar for BCs, but this was not yet observed because usually cold atom BCs are confined in a trapping potential and they don't uh, free fall uh, for long enough times in order to see this self, uh, self squeezing effect. Okay, now with that, I hope I'm not too much over time. Uh, I uh, uh, want to um, just summarize. Uh, so, oops. Uh, so, I wanted to say there's uh, many different aspects of um, quantum optics and gravity interface related to experiments. So, I think this, you know, I forgot to mention, this is the most interesting aspect of it, of course. Uh, and so, one is high precision probes. I gave an example of gravitational wave detection, interference of clocks, uh, where you actually can probe some post-Newtonian effects, uh, which are uh, uh, which appear only in the quantum regime. So this entanglement between internal and external degrees of freedom is a purely gravitational effect and universal, uh, which does not appear classically in either the Newtonian limit. Then one can also look at different speculative models, such as, for example, optomechanics used for uh, uh, these uh, modified uncertainty principle tests. And then finally, uh, I said a few words that there's actually squeeze. So you applying tools and known facts from quantum optics, one can show that axions and dark matters is actually also squeezed in, in cosmological settings. Okay, and with that, I want to, of course, acknowledge you know, my collaborator oops, and my group. Uh, and so I'll leave this slide up. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks, Igor. That was a really good talk. Um, yeah, it's really interesting, everything. Um, we have, unfortunately, uh, finish the Q&A time, but I'll leave it to the organizers of the conference to decide whether we should do a Q&A into the panel discussion time. So, yeah, on the phone. I think maybe, uh, yeah, maybe it's a good idea to go for the full question and answer and maybe, sorry, uh, the, uh, panel the panel, just, uh, let's, let's do that. Yeah, maybe that's, yeah. Then I'll stop share and we can. So I can pin today's all the lecture, uh, lectures. So let me do it and then we can start. Um, Martin there, yeah, pin. And then um, with the other speaker, so I can't. Ben is around, are you here, Ben? Yes. Yeah. I uh, just want to pin you as well. So I'm just looking at sure. your, um, yeah, I could now uh, see you. Um, but while I'm, I'm pinning, uh, maybe people can already start asking questions. I mean, it, it may take a few minutes for me to 